and welcome to the SharePoint Framework and JavaScript Special Interest Group biweekly meeting. It is June 8th, 2017. We've got a couple of really cool demos here for you today and uh, want to jump right into it. But first, as always, we want to start with uh, what are we all about? What are we doing on the calls? and uh, kind of what's the purpose of this. So we are a subset of the SharePoint Patterns and Practices program, um, and we focus on client-side development, uh, very specifically around SharePoint framework, and as well around building this JavaScript core component uh, to help folks with their client-side development. Uh, so that's kind of uh, why we were started, is to give uh, folks interested in client-side development a little more of a focused uh, session, whereas, you know, kind of we weren't able to cover in a lot of detail in sort of the monthly community calls. Um, and we've done the same thing. So if you're interested as well in the core component or the PowerShell component, please do check out. There's a special interest group for those as well. You can, of course, attend as many of these calls as you like. We're always happy to see folks on the calls. So down at the bottom, we've got two links to AKA MS SPP and P dash community will take you to the Microsoft tech community, which is a great general place to ask questions uh, of uh, your peers of the community about SharePoint development, uh, specific development questions, best practices, things like that. The bottom link dev.office.com slash SharePoint is your one stop shop for all things SharePoint development. So whether you are new to and want to learn about the SharePoint framework, whether you're doing add-in development, or whether you're doing full trust code solution development, uh, you can find resources for that at that link. So we've got all, we, it's not completely done. It's obviously like everything, a work in progress, but we're working to consolidate all our resources to that location for SharePoint development. And you can find all of the resources for SharePoint framework development uh, at that uh, location as well. So from getting started in the very simple tutorials to some of the more advanced stuff as well as uh, notes on preview features and things that might be coming out. And that's something actually Vesa will talk about shortly is we've just released a bunch of dev preview features for the SharePoint framework extensions, which is going to be uh, a really powerful tool to enable a lot of those scenarios uh, we might have uh, lost it a little bit with the transition to modern sites at first. Um, so we're working hard to bring those back. We do realize how important they are uh, to all of you out there in the community and for the work you're doing. Um, it's just a matter of, of us uh, getting a little caught up, I suppose. But so Vase is going to show that stuff off. I think it's really exciting. It's going to be really powerful. A lot you can do. Pardon me. Um, so I cheated a little bit, uh, told you some of what's coming up, but we'll have a quick update on the uh, JavaScript core component. Uh, VESA will go over the SharePoint framework latest news as well as some, some news about those framework extensions. VESA is going to show those off. And then we've got Andrew Kolchikov, who is going to do uh, a demo around using the JS core library in Node.js with the help of a library uh, for sort of wrapping the node configuration for the core library. It makes things a lot simpler, and it handles some of the, uh, the stubbing and things. But I'll let him talk through that. Again, a very cool uh, community project, so I'd like to see that. And we'll see at the end. Um, we got a lot of demos, so we'll see at the end about open discussion. But always feel free to ask questions um, and make comments in the IM window, as always. I want to remind folks of the opportunities to participate. Um, in this special interest group or in sort of the patterns and practices program as a whole, um, we definitely welcome and are encouraged and are looking for folks from the community who want to demo a SharePoint framework web part or, or now a SharePoint uh, framework extensions project uh, that they've worked on, um, something you know cool that you've worked on and you just want to show it off. It can be production ready or it can be kind of just a, a sort of proof of concept. Um, as well, anything involving the JavaScript core library uh, or in general, anything around client side development. Uh, happy to have demos, discussions on that as well. We've had some really neat stuff on different frameworks, uh, other you know different techniques people use in, for general client-side development, which I think is uh, really exciting. Uh, contribute on GitHub, so for the JavaScript core component or any of the other uh, repos for the SharePoint framework stuff, and provide feedback. So that contributed on GitHub is part of the feedback. So submitting issues, um, submitting issues around the SharePoint framework or any of the other patterns and practices stuff 
Um, that feedback really drives, one, us getting issues fixed, and two, development of new features. So when we hear somebody's like, can we do X, and we look at it, and we say, well, yeah, we can help with that, um, that absolutely is feedback we want, and we're excited to help uh, bring those new features in um, you know, as possible, um, as it's supported by the underlying APIs and as well matches uh, you know, with our ability to deliver that. So uh, great opportunity to contribute. And again, if you ever want a demo, uh, open invitation to anybody either on the call today or, or watching the video in the future, uh, just get in touch with us. We'd love to have you demo, uh, so reach out. So quick updates here on the JavaScript core component. We're going to release uh, 206 Monday, June 12th. And I'm holding off. Originally, it was scheduled for tomorrow, Friday. But I did want to give folks uh, one more chance. Um, there's a, uh, I'm not going to say a lot of issues, but there's some issues that have been reported um, that we had follow-up questions on that we couldn't necessarily reproduce or that it wasn't clear to us what necessarily the issue was. So I wanted to give ch folks one last chance to follow up, um, you know, give us some more details, answer our questions, because we would love to fix these issues or unblock folks or or solve whatever the problem is but uh, we need a little bit more information on some of the stuff that's out there um, just a reminder if if you've submitted an issue and we think we've answered it and we've closed it please do reopen that issue if you if you need to continue the conversation or have additional questions it's very easy for us to miss things when they're not reopened um, so please do reopen it we're very happy to continue helping um, you know if, if you keep having problems or additional questions or need some clarification we really do want to help but it's just very easy for us to miss stuff if it's not reopened so please do reopen those issues um, and I also wanted to say, don't be afraid to mark uh, issues as a question. We've got different categories there. Um, we're not going to ignore it if it's a question. We do, again, want to help very much, but uh, it helps us just understand what's coming in and track it a little better. So if you found a bug with the library, feel free to mark it as a bug. We'd, we'd love that. We'd love to get it fixed. But if you have more of a question, please do mark it as a question. It just helps us you know, kind of categorize things and see what's coming in a little bit. Um, and it's definitely not going to get ignored if you don't mark it as a bug. Um, so just a quick note there. Uh, so I did want to give a little bit of an update on Graph. So some of you have heard or seen um, that the Graph HTTP client is part of, uh, is going to be part or is part, depending on if you're in the dev preview or not, of the SharePoint framework. So we're going to start there. Uh, because that's going to simplify all sort of the authentication uh, plumbing and those sorts of things so we can sort of build our fluent API around that. Um, what that doesn't solve is wanting to call graph, for example, from Node.js or from, well, anywhere outside of the SharePoint framework. So my thinking there is let's do it one step at a time. It allows us to start to build out and get the shape of the fluent API. And then later we can kind of make it pluggable what's actually going to make those requests uh, and handle the auth. So uh, it'll let us get started, um, and that'll have the same limitations that the Graph HTTP client has within SharePoint Framework, meaning uh, you can only call a subset of the Graph currently, and that will, of course, be expanding over time. So we'll carry on those same limitations because we'll be calling through that client, but we'll grow as the abilities of the, of the, the Graph client grows in SharePoint Framework, and then we'll grow as well because I don't want to ignore uh, the need to call uh, graph from outside of SharePoint Framework or outside of uh, or outside SharePoint in general at all, like in Node. <clears throat> and another comment on graph, what we'll probably end up doing is producing uh, extra files. And what I mean by that is, so right now there's like PNP.js. We're probably going to end up with something like PNP.js will be everything. And we might have PNP-graph.js and PNP-sp.js as all part of the dist folder. For folks that if you're not doing anything with graph, maybe you don't need that extra weight in your project. So we're going to be mindful of that. We'll look at that. Again, none of this work has started early days, but I, I did want to provide an update because it's kind of been an ongoing conversation. And then another conversation that I've thought a lot about in the past, and I've gotten enough questions, I did want to sort of talk about it a little bit. Um, I've had some folks ask, why don't we have sort of a, an object system in uh, our JavaScript core library? 
Uh, and we sort of do. You can inherit from web and list, and we've talked about that in the past, and you can go back and look at those uh, videos. But what we've done is very lightweight, very base. So it doesn't have a lot of complexity. And different folks are exploring different ways to do it. And one of the reasons we don't do it is everybody would solve this problem differently. I would do it differently from everybody in the call, and everybody in the call would likely do it different from me. So I would hate to have a solution that 5% of the people love and 95% of the people hate. That seems lame. Um, and there's no way we could support everything everyone wants to do, right? It's, there's no way to be that generic at that level, like a level above what we're already providing. So, um, you know, those are kind of the reasons. And I'm also not sure it would be appropriate for us. Uh, coming back to that, everybody would do it differently and everybody wants to use different frameworks that all work a little bit differently. Um, you know, for example, React kind of handles binding a little bit differently than, say, Angular, then again, say, Knockout. Um, it'd be really hard to match all that. And it's also, I want to say, a perfect opportunity for a community project. So if you've got an idea for kind of an object wrapper around the JavaScript core, please pursue that. I think it's a super uh, valuable idea and a great contribution to the community. And it's the kind of thing that would be perfect to uh, develop and then demo on this call. And then uh, it provides that opportunity if folks find it useful, they can use it without you know, us from sort of a core perspective dictating this is how we believe uh, you should create your objects and manage your objects. Because again, I don't think I can solve that problem in a way that everyone would be happy with or that will even solve the problem for every, you know everybody's needs. So I think it's a great chance for a community project. I know there's a few folks out there already working on uh, things like this, and I would very much encourage you to do that. Let us know how it's going. Keep us in the loop. Um, if there's things we can do in the core to make that better, easier, please do let us know. Again, I think it's a very valid uh, pursuit, uh, but not something we're going to pursue and push out from kind of the core team perspective, um, at least at this point. So I just wanted to comment on that a little bit. So in line with all that, please keep all the amazing feedback coming. There's two links down there at the bottom, again, for the SharePoint PNP community. Um, that goes to the same Microsoft Tech community. And then our Gitter, which is specific to the JavaScript core library. If you have comments, questions around uh, the core library, please do hit us up on Gitter. So now I'll pass things over to Vesa so he can give us an update on the SharePoint framework. Patrick, thank you. So I'll take over the presentation and hopefully the order is yep. decent at least. Sound oh. good and I see the presentation. Excellent, excellent. So um, so SharePoint Framework, latest guidance samples and work uh, we do in engineering. So obviously this week has been a big thing for us uh, because we came live uh, with the SharePoint Framework extensions uh, and that's now available in the dev preview. I'm gonna show that uh, some of the tutorial work uh, in practice in this call as well and we can talk about what does it mean and, and all of that uh, based on your questions as well. Uh, before we actually go to the extensions, just wanted to pinpoint this one. Uh, because I think we actually had to blog post out uh, since last special interest group. So there is an updated SharePoint Framework developer training packets available, uh, including like 30 different videos uh, where we where uh, Todd Patinsky, well, I do a few videos and Todd Patinsky is doing the rest, uh, is explaining <clears throat> different functionalities, different ways of uh, stuff in SharePoint framework. That's only for client-side web parts right now, and it's going to be updated at some point. The, really, the key point of this one, just want to emphasize um, that in the messaging as well, this is meant to be for you to use any way you want. So if you're looking into delivering a local, uh, let's say, training in your region or within your country, uh, you can pull down the material, you can modify that any way you want, and you can do that and deliver it down. Uh, or if you want to just use the slides in a conference presentation, feel free to do that as well. So there's a lot of value within the package. Uh, cool. 
on the SharePoint frameworks, uh, so, so SharePoint framework extension. So let's actually uh, go to this true with few slides, and then I'm going to do a live demo, and I'll I'll be watching the IAM window if there's any live questions around this one. But SharePoint framework extensions is now available in Dev Preview. Uh, it is available in Dev Tenants. Uh, so if you're using a first release tenant or a normal production tenant, it is not available there yet. So you need to have a Dev Tenant. Uh, you can get a free developer tenant from a dev program and actually paste in that url uh, in the window as well because that's uh, apparently people are not aware that you can get a free uh, free tenant easily uh, i'm just going to test the url and paste that one in yes so you can sign up on the Office 365 Developer Program, and you'll get a free Office 365 Developer Tenant with 25 accounts. Uh, so you're able to then test different accounts, different permissions, and all of that. Uh, at some point, uh, I wouldn't say pretty soon, at some point, uh, the permissions uh, will go in Dev Preview in first release tenants as well. So, we will, so you will be able to test them uh, with your live content but they will be still in Dev Preview. The GA uh, for uh, the actual production usage, uh, has the schedule for GA has not been yet set. It is highly dependent on what kind of feedback we're getting, what kind of things we're finding, and all of that. So, uh, so we don't have an exit date for GA, but it's going to happen uh, within months, uh, So, uh, or who knows, it might be even faster than that and kind of things we're finding, what kind of feedback people are giving us and, and the ideas what we're giving, uh, getting from you as well. Um, on, the, on the quick question from uh, Russell, uh, do I get 25 accounts on my old dev tenant as well or do I need to create a new one? My, my understanding actually, unfortunately, I tested that and I saw at least my really old dev tenant only has a one account. So I don't, apparently it's not activated on there. Maybe we should report that somewhere, but I'm, I'm a wrong person for that. Now, um, coming back on the extensions. So uh, what we've done, and we've been going through this a lot uh, in the past special interest group calls as well. But there's three different extensions to start with. And this is just a start. We're looking into having additional extensions as well. Uh, these are just the three which are released right now to Dev Preview, uh, which are the application customizer and list view command set and field customizer. The application customizer is there to extend the UI or embed JavaScript. There's two kind of a different distinct scenarios. So you can modify, you can embed, let's say, widgets and functionalities and make new make footers on the on the pages using the application customizer, or your JavaScript might be just running on a page without actually having a UI. So it could be, let's say, App uh, Analytics, Azure App Analytics. It could be Google Analytics. It could be something else which is running on a page. The list view common set is there mainly to, uh, well, it's there to add buttons and actions and customizations on the modern lists. Uh, so you're able to execute code when somebody clicks a button. Uh, and there's additional intelligence there. So you're able to, for example, light up your button whenever multiple items has been selected. Um, and you're able to target the toolbar or the context menu uh, of an individual item. Uh, and then the third one is the field customizer to modify the rendering of the field. And that's right now in the read-only uh, mode. We're looking into extending that to the edit mode as well. Uh, but those are the three different distinct uh, models. Uh, uh, give me one second. Oh, yes. So, sorry for flipping slightly on the slides. I needed to check which of the slides I, I took for this uh, community. So. All of these um, can be now uh, developed in the dev tenants. Uh, we do have a special debugging experience. I'm going to show that one in, in practice as well. Um, if you want to uh, deploy them truly, uh, then there's a few things which need to happen. So you need to deploy the, the SharePoint solution to the app catalog. You need to update the put the JavaScript files on the CDN, and then install the application to an individual SharePoint site. All of this is actually included in our tutorials. So if you run through, for example, tutorial for field customizer, 
start from scratch, you extend the code, you'll modify that in a debug mode, then you package the code, then you deploy the code and put it hosting, and you can put it hosting in the CDN. So you'll understand essentially how the whole flow actually works. Uh, personally, I'm pretty pretty happy with the tutorials. There might be obviously some grammar issues, which we've been fixing uh, uh, today as well, because there's a lot of English in those tutorials, but uh, the story, what the tutorials are actually showing uh, is pretty decent. And that's a Finnish way of saying uh, they're actually pretty good. Good. Um, uh, quick, uh, there's already a quick question, uh, and thank you, Ken, for the feedback. And thanks, oh, Chris, uh, and thanks, Chris, for fixing some of the grammar issues as well. Um, there's a good question from Darren around uh, uh, SPF exams. How do I deploy my SPFX to, let's say, 100,000 site collections or 200 site collections or whatever? <clears throat> Pretty soon, there will be a capability to, to uh, set a uh, configuration in your JSON files. Uh, and in the we're able to say that this particular customization, is it a client-side webboard or an extension, should be automatically available across all of the sites. So you do not have to explicitly install the SPFX solution a site-by-site -site basis. So that's a step number one. The step number two will be APIs to also enable installing SPFX solutions or add-ins to individual sites. And that's being specced uh, as well. So we absolutely understand the requirement. We absolutely understand how, how it has to work and we need to make it simple. Uh, and it's all a roadmap. Uh, some of that has been already developed. It's just a matter of getting it out um, and documented. So we're getting there. We need to be slightly patient still. Now, uh, just to clarify also the logical architecture of an extension, it is exactly the same as with client-side web parts. So essentially, you'll write your code uh, in a SharePoint framework solution. The solution structure is exactly the same. Just that the base class is what you're using in TypeScript are slightly different. You're not writing a web part. You're writing <clears throat> a field extension or an application customized for a list view common set. And I'll share that one in practice in a second. But eventually, when you're ready, uh, the JavaScript library will be hosted in CDN uh, in the same way as client-side web parts, and you'll reference, and that will be referenced by uh, the SharePoint. So all good from that perspective. No changes from there. Now, <laughs> this is kind of an interesting thing uh, around the extensions, um, and I I think we didn't show this one in the last uh, special interest group call either. Uh, but to be able to debug SharePoint uh, framework extensions, we need to do some additional things. Um, the SharePoint Framework Workbench, the local workbench or the online workbench, currently only supports web pods. So there's no way of debugging or testing your extensions using the workbench. And to address that, um, uh, we have uh, introduced this debugging uh, query parameters. So essentially what you can do is debug against live SharePoint site with your content and loading essentially the code from your local host. But you need to apply and follow on the specific query parameters and put them on a URL. And that will then essentially tell SharePoint that, hey, it is fine that we're loading this manifest file from a local host and load this particular client component ID. And then it's being executed and applied on the, on the page. And I'll show that one in practice uh, in the demo. So it's a slightly different experience as with client-side web parts. We're looking into having a, a extension support in the workbench as well, uh, that is in the roadmap. Uh, but the good, th good thing about this approach is that you're able to be debugging and testing on top of your existing data. And that's really a great thing. So if you have existing list of data and documents, whatever, you're able to execute or host your stuff on top of it. And that's, that's a really, really highly beneficial. Good. Um, Uh, the, the, the Andrew Connell is asking, will this debugging change before GA? Will we get workbench debugging both online and local? Um, for the, I'm not sure if we can get it uh, by GA, uh, but to be honest, uh, even though we would have work debugging for extensions, we, we will keep the debugging URLs, uh, debugging query parameters there, so you're able to test against the live data, because that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you're able to run it uh, properly. Uh, and yes, uh, I just somewhat answer it. Um, 
on upgrading of a different version of SharePoint Framework web parts, we're looking into the, having that on an API as well. Just quickly scanning through the questions before I head to the demo. Uh, any chance to improve workman so it behaves like a normal page, for example, fixed wide. Uh, good fit. Uh, I would add it into SP DevDocs issue list as a suggestion. Uh, so getting more clarity on the on the request. Uh, good, good, good. Uh, and this is really killing usefulness of the workbench as a whole, my, but very disappointed if not in GA. All with you there, AC. Uh, so uh, most likely we'll get it by the GA. It really depends when the GA happens. And that really is dependent on what kind of information and input we're getting for you guys. Uh, so we'll see. It should be there, uh, but there's quite a lot of, uh, a lot of items look map. Uh, obviously, that has been uh, it, that is a high priority thing, but there's a lot of high priority other things as well. That's always the challenge. Good. Uh, I think my following slide is actually the demo slide. No, it isn't. Deployment of an extension. So quickly just uh, covering this one as well. So we can do the debugging against the live data, which is great because uh, if you would be doing debugging against Workbench, you wouldn't actually have, you're unable to configure, let's say lists and fields and all of that. Um, and you can't really have the exact same experience as with the live data. Um, so you can do that. Uh, then you need to decide over so where the customization will be hosted. Uh, that's a CDN. Technically, it could be a document library in SharePoint, which is not a CDN, but you can enable that to be a CDN. Uh, so there's multiple options. Um, updating target hosting URL in the solution is, is updating the right manifest JSON file in the config folder. Uh, and then you essentially do package solution and you copy your assets to the CDN. And at that point, uh, we'll add the solution package to the app catalog. Now, the step number five is not uh, the challenge because right now, currently, you will need to get uh, the solution to install on the sites where you actually want to use that. And that's the one which we will be addressing relatively soon, like mentioned uh, when we started the discussion. Uh, but for the time being, the step number five has to happen to be able to get the extension work in the sign. And step number six has to happen as well, because step number six is essentially making sure that you are associating your extension to the right scope and the right object. Now, in our tutorials, we are using feature framework inside of the SharePoint framework to do that. Um, you can absolutely do exactly the same using CSA or uh, using REST APIs. Um, the reason why we chose to show the feature framework way of doing that in the tutorials is simply because, for example, uh, there's no support for PowerShell, as an example, uh, in a non-Windows machines, or well, there might be, or there will be in the future, but there's no PMP PowerShells, which would be super useful to associate client-side component ID to the custom actions or to the field. But I'll show you that one in practice by showing the feature XMLs uh, in the solutions, in the tutorial solutions in the following slide or in the demo. I think I, I didn't have anything else here. Cool. Because we need to have some time for Andrew as well. Uh, so let me actually share my screen and crossing fingers that uh, network guards are with us. So. Cool. Somebody needs to tell me when the screen is it. Excellent. If you got it, then everybody else got it as well. So uh, we've shown this one before in the special interest group uh, course. So obviously, if you have the latest version of the Yeoman template, there is a new selection uh, with just the extensions. If you choose that, uh, it's going to ask you, do you want to create an application customizer, field customizer, or at least few comments in. Um, and uh, after that, it's going to then request additional details. I'm actually just now because we all know that scaffolding takes a while. So there's no point for doing that. Um, what I'm using is um, our tutorial samples. Tutorial samples uh, are the ones which you will end up having if you follow up on the tutorials which are released uh, in our dev.com slash SharePoint location. These are also available in GitHub. Uh, so. Uh, SharePoint SV DevFX, and that was not right, but let's go in here and let's jump to the right location. Using an alternative profile, so I didn't actually, did a typo, uh, where's my extension? 
SPDF FX not. Sorry. <laughs> Extensions. There we go. So uh, in GitHub, uh, SharePoint, SPDF FX extensions, we already have a one community contribution here as well from Alex uh, for, uh, from yesterday, uh, showing React-based field uh, slider uh, presentation. But if you go to the tutorials folder, um, you can actually set, uh, download or have a look on the out outcome of the tutorials. So if you, for some reason you can't make the tutorials work uh, or there's some issues on the on the guidance, you can always pull this down and this has been tested in multiple machines um, and then compare your solution against this and then figure out what's wrong. Maybe to mention, technically all of these three uh, could have been in a one solution as well. So you can absolutely have a one complex SPFX solution, including multiple different component types. So absolutely doable. Uh, and that's really the intention as well. Now, let's come uh, in here and let me start the Visual Studio code, which apparently already had an open in here. Cool. So the Visual Studio Code solution uh, for the extensions is exactly the same. So the shell solution is exactly the same, and you can see the files which are familiar if you've done a client-side web part development. So package solution and all of that, uh, all of these are exactly working exactly like a client-side solution. What we essentially have a small difference in the classes and implementations of the actual extensions. Uh, and in here, uh, because this is an application extension, uh, we are inheriting that from a uh, base class uh, customizer. And this is the outcome of the tutorial where we also use the placeholders uh, from a page. So essentially we are outputting, uh, outputting uh, uh, our HTML directly from uh, our own render, the, the placeholder, uh, which is called page header or page so there's few pages uh, right now in the dev preview. There's two uh, placeholders, uh, which is page header and page footer, um, and in future there will be more placeholders available where you can actually attach your uh, things. So um, now. Uh, in here, uh, the implementation style, everything else is pretty much almost like within the client side web part. Uh, so you can see that we're just injecting, injecting maybe is a wrong word, we're adding HTML uh, in the inner HTML out just, uh, which we're doing in this, what we're doing uh, for this implementation. And the same applies for the footer. Now, when the implementation is done, uh, then we get to that, um, the implementations part is obviously dependent on what we wanna do. Uh, so, but how do we actually do debugging? So let me uh, show that one in practice. We need a few things. Uh, we need to have the unique ID uh, of, the, uh, of the extension. Uh, so when we are hooking up to debugging using the debugging query parameters, uh, we are actually associating to the right application uh, or ID. And we need to have Visual Studio, sorry, SharePoint uh, online tenant, uh, which is the developer tenant right now. In future, obviously, will be supported in other tenants as well. I will use uh, just this document library as my hosting point. Really doesn't matter uh, where you want to do the debugging. Or, well, obviously, if you are writing a field customizer, then you would have to use a list. Uh, if, you, if you're writing an application customizer, you can use any other locations as well. Now, this is a small, uh, a tricky thing. Uh, so in our tutorials and in the sample documentation, uh, we'll actually explaining this one as well. Uh, we are, we're writing additional documentation where all of this is being uh, clarified. But basically what we need to do, because we want to test application customizer, uh, we need to use a specific debugging uh, query parameter. And in here, uh, that essentially means that, hey, SharePoint load main SPFX if it's not on the page. Hey, SharePoint load the manifest from a local host. Do not, so that's fine, load them from a local host, not so from a central location. The custom action, uh, this is a custom action implementation. And this is the ID, unique ID of my customization. So essentially, if I open up the Visual Studio code, uh, that is the value which needs to match. So the ID from the JSON uh, and to the query parameter in here. 
because this is an application customizer, my location is client side extension dot application customizer. Uh, so we're essentially telling for SharePoint that it's an application customizer, and I can have additional properties here as well. So I can provide uh, instance based properties, which could then change the behavior of the implementation or the let's say the extension uh, based on the properties what you're passing uh, passing in. Now, let me update that. Uh, I just noticed that that's not the, actually the property set what I want to use. So let me get uh, that one right for my particular extension. If you're wondering on the URLs, uh, it is like mentioned, this is mentioned in the uh, tutorials and also in the tutorial samples, we're also upon pinpointing uh, what's the query parameters and how that should be working uh, within your tenant. Now let's get back on, on the page and on the notepad and I'm going to copy that query parameter. There's my uh, uh, document library, uh, adding that query parameter there. And yes, it gets slightly messy, uh, but I'm clicking uh, enter. What's going to happen is that the SharePoint realizes that, hey, you want to load that from on-premises and do debug streams. Now, in this case, I just realized that I'm not actually running my local host. So obviously it's going to say, well, I can't load. There was nothing hosted there. So let's do dismiss. Let's fix the situation. Get here and do call up serve no browser because there's no point of starting the local workbench because there's no value in a local workbench in this scenario. So that's why there's a no browser switch, what I'm using. Cool, local host running. Uh, I can go back in the URL and do refresh, do an enter there. It's gonna again request or ask me, do I wanna load those deeper scripts? And the answer is in this case, yes. And we can see the page to behave differently. And no, it didn't. Wonder what was wrong. Not that went well. Let's see. I'm gonna do that one more time. Request is getting in. Is my interesting? Well, let's actually do some debugging then. We have plenty of time, right? Uh, custom actions URL query parameters is improperly formatted. Okay, cool. Let's fix that. So let me actually get this pretty okay uh, uh, exception uh, descriptions in the console. Uh, so let's close that one. Let's get back in our here. Let's actually take that one, which is now not just copied by me. So I did a mistake probably on the on the formatting. And let's actually get rid of that and paste that one in. And load debug scripts. And there we go. We can actually get see under on the page uh, injected uh, by our customization, which is running from on-premises. That was a good debugging exercise as well. So you can see um, that the information is actually quite nicely output in the console window. But in this case, so we, we were not doing anything else than outputting, uh, <laughs> outputting uh, header and footer on the page. Uh, and then uh, I can obviously, the, the proper uh, parameters here, uh, properties which are part to the extension, I can modify them, uh, seek a demo and we can see that the footer area will be changed when I load the scripts and it is now saying sick call demo. So I can parameterize the implementation based on the, again, on the business requirements. Uh, maybe a small point kind of a clarifying that one. So let me come back on the application customizer and clarify that one here as well. So. The current implementation uh, is that we're looking into placeholder on the page. This is my, the, we're looking into the page placeholder. Uh, and then we're looking in to have a property called header. Um, and so in my case, um, I actually provided the property called header in the query parameters. So this one actually will have value. All of this uh, deserialization, serialization will happen automatically, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, as long as the string matches uh, the property name, which is being used in the property in the query parameters. Good. Um, that's pretty much what I was planning to actually show because I don't want to uh, eat up too much time from. Uh, 
entry and also making sure that we have time for Q&A in the end. Uh, we will release a webcast uh, which will talk about um, the, the debugging and deployment and everything else on Monday. So that's coming out live uh, on Monday as well. Now, uh, what are the, the any plans for additional well-known divs on the page? Uh, so we're looking into having uh, absolutely additional placeholders. Right now, technically, so let me show you that one in practice. Uh, you can actually see that the available placeholders are page header and page footer, uh, even in our console application writing. Um, looking into having additional place, uh, page placeholders in a page uh, for navigation, for additional controls and all of that. And that's really good feedback as well. Uh, so we can actually understand the business requirement and what kind of things people want to do um, and get that input into engineering. Technical framework is there. So it's just a matter for us for exposing you guys additional secured placeholders, which will be then taking, uh, which will be then have to be implemented in the list views and library views and pages and all of that. Um, one thing maybe to notice, uh, I'm going to take two minutes on the on the debugging experience. Uh, so if I do the same, let me actually steal that query parameter because that's fine. If I go to my home page, uh, I've more, oh, there we go. So let me do the query parameter in the home page. Well, you can see that we're loading the page uh, and in the pages, current implementation of the modern pages. Um, and to be honest, personally, I don't know why, uh, looking into this one as well, we do not have a footer at this point. Um, obviously, the page could be pretty long, uh, but this page is not long. So technically, the footer, for some reason, is not in the modern pages. I haven't synced with a with the, uh, the chief uh, around the modern pages, so I need to follow up on that one to understand why it's not there. But that uh, header section is over there. And then there's a comment from Ralph around that massive header here. And yes, I know, uh, trust me. And I, I think they are aware of that. They We need to uh, do something for that one as well. Uh, and maybe one thing also, if you're testing this uh, customizations before we turn into entry, and I can do Q&A on the on the the af during the demos and after the q a as well um answering ASA's comment uh github issue list yes please questions github issue list uh especially now that we are in dev preview github issue list if it's something related on uh client-side web parts and it's a new feature such as then then use a voice but right now around the extensions, please add those things to the GitHub issue list. And let me actually share that location as well. So SP Dev Docs uh, issues. So if there are missing things, missing values, um, or scenarios which are not missing, or documentation is not good enough, or whatever, please use the issue list. All of these issues are getting automatically synced to our Visual Studio Online, uh, and we can assign them internally to engineering on top of the things. Um, so please let us, let us know. You don't like something, tell us. We'll try to fix it uh, if it's possible. So please be active and share what's now, the one thing before we go to the uh, Andrew's demo, um, this is slightly weird, uh, I would say, uh, but within the site contents, uh, you can absolutely do uh, similar kind of testing uh, as with uh, the other pages. Uh, give me a second. I'm just going to copy the query parameter in the site contents uh, and just double checking that the query parameter was properly done. Yes, it is. So now if I load this, and I load my debug scripts. It actually does work right now. Uh, it's slightly different currently because we are in a dev preview and we'll fix this in the in the future. In the site contents page, uh, do reasons or another, and personally not aware yet why, investigating on this one, um, I'm, I do not own this page. Um, we are HTTP address is getting encoded. 
So don't get oop, don't get fooled by this. Uh, I want to get this one recorded so you're aware of this and you'll avoid the situation and you don't bang your head against the wall with this one. So the Deepak Manifest file HTTP address, uh, HTTPS address is getting encoded. The problem of this is that right now with the current implementation, if I refresh this page with those values, things do not work. It's going to actually fail to the encoding. So this is only in the site contents page. If you're doing testing in the modern pages or in the list and libraries, this doesn't happen. So we need to we need to make sure uh, that we'll fix this in the site content page uh, sooner or later. It requires most likely a server side update. But that's a kind of a hint, uh, a tip when you're doing test on the extensions. So don't get fooled by this. The easiest way to to fix that is actually do the testing in, the, in a document library or in the list. Uh, these do not have the similar kind of issue. So putting that same query parameter here, no encoding and everything is fine. Took a while to figure out what's actually happening here. Good. I think that's it for the extensions and we'll continue on the, on the releasing new stuff on the extensions, videos, webcasts, documentations gradually. Um, let us know if something is missing and let us know if you might be thinking that it, it might be, it should be obvious that they're telling X and Y and Z around the, the extensions. Uh, go to the issue list at an entry. Uh, trust me, we're watching that issue list pretty closely um, and I'll get it assigned. We'll work on the documentation as well. So please let us know what's missing. Um, and I'll get back to the IAM window, but I'll let uh, I'll leave Andrew to take the lead on his demo and Node.js uh, using SP BNP JS in Node.js uh, side. So Andrew, you can actually just start sharing, and it's gonna my screen to your screen. <laughs> Hello, uh, please let me know uh, if you can see the screen. Yep, it's loading now. I got okay. it on my end. Cool. cool. Uh, so uh, I'm going to show a couple of slides and then uh, six different uh, examples with uh, the library. Uh, so hi there. Uh, my name is Andrew Kildikov. I'm a SharePoint developer and a consultant at Arvo Systems. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how to master PNPGS core library in Node.js. Before I uh, kick off, uh, let me say a few words about myself. On the first place, I'm a SharePoint guy. I've been in SharePoint projects for around seven years, developing and implementing solutions for medium and large businesses. Also, I'm a passionate uh, Node.js and uh, JavaScript developer. The last year was so saturated with open source projects on GitHub. Some of them uh, found active users who already reported uh, positive feedback. Uh, from time to time, I'm blogging with uh, posts about SharePoint and Node.js, uh, revealing some use cases which I experienced. And you can reach me in Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, and Gator. But uh, let's get started with uh, today's topic. Uh, first off, uh, let me mention that uh, Node.js occupies huge place in modern development and it really deserves attention. It's a holy word topic in some way, so I'm not going uh, declaring JavaScript better than any other technologies uh, which can actually live together in peace and uh, complete each other. But applications in Node.js are capable for awesome things, especially when one should deal with uh, APIs, microservices, cross-platform applications, or, and build uh, pipelines automation. Node.js infrastructure provides wonderful feature than working with the REST APIs, especially when we come to understanding that the same code base can be used in browser and on the server. And uh, in the in context of this presentation, by running on the server, I mean a JavaScript application outside a browser. So uh, it can be a natural server or a client machine as well. Applications written in uh, Node.js uh, can be integrated with SharePoint and uh, consume APIs, including even legacy like SOP web services. 
to make a Node.js application capable of talking to an API, it should be authenticated. And um, I'm not going to cover authentication topic here. It is a huge one. I just want to say that uh, for most authentication, uh, for most authentication routines can be simplified simplified using OS libraries. Uh, in my case, I would recommend to notice POs by Sergey Sergeyev, which uh, supports a variety of different authentication strategies. Uh, when the app uh, is authenticated in SharePoint, it owns uh, OS headers uh, that should be merged in all requests to the server. And uh, after this, applications uh, are capable of sending a get or post request to APIs and points. Let me switch from Node.js um, to another hero of the topic, uh, PMPJS core library. In, uh, PMP uh, product family, uh, there is a number of different technologies, and today we're talking about JavaScript library, uh, wrap around uh, SharePoint REST API, and let me call uh, PMP JS Core um, by PMP for short uh, for the rest of this demo. Um, two words about PMP. Uh, it masters REST API capabilities. It provides a fluent a syntax. Uh, it is written in TypeScript, inspires using promises and null call callbacks, and uh, highly recommended for front end projects with SharePoint. I got started with uh, PMP for around a year ago. In uh, September 2016, I included PMP as a dependency to the first production project with PMP. Uh, since then, more and more front end applications which I created used PMP. Um, after the next half a year, uh, I forgot how to write code in JSON and how to wrap REST AJAX request by myself. Just kidding. But uh, yeah, a number of cases when uh, PNP was uh, preferred over al alternatives uh, was growing. And uh, with time, I got an idea to reuse some code for Node.js uh, environment. It was a requirement for development of line desktop client for some complex UI and data model. Uh, that application should have a repeated UI layer and have an ability to receive updates without physical access to SharePoint server and a corporate network. And you can imagine how many efforts can be spent on such a task. And actually it had been done less than a week. Electron application almost completely reused UI layer. Node.js server side code was in sync job and schedule tasks. And um, you might guess what was in charge for communication level? Yes, it was uh, the first implementation of uh, PNP JS Core outside a browser, um, my, my first implementation of the library. Uh, after this, there were other tasks with uh, PNP and Node.js and uh, some more uh, on the horizon. And do you know what? Mm, I hate to repeat myself. So, uh, for the reusability purposes, I created a drop-in library. The library is named as PNP node or PNP node. Uh, it is an open source available on GitHub and published to NPM. Uh, PNP node uh, has uh, node POs integrated, so it covers all authentication scenarios the library provides. Uh, PMP node has uh, implemented SharePoint aware fetch client. And uh, as a result, uh, a developer uh, can add dependency for PMP node and uh, JS Core library to the project and in uh, five lines away, literally, uh, start using uh, PMP and uh, JS Core uh, in node. Oh, demo time. Um, so let's get our hands dirty with some code. Uh, hmm. uh, so uh, to find the library, um, you can Google for PNP node, sorry, PNP node, and uh, it's very likely that it will be some there here. Maybe even on the first place, maybe not. Um, the library is published to NPM. Uh, project itself uh, located on GitHub. 
uh, documentation contains information that uh, one should know before starting uh, starting using the library, um, even animated demo. Uh, PNP node is written in TypeScript uh, with all consequent advantages. And, um, well, actually, uh, let's um, create a blank project. Uh, here we are. Uh, so, an ordinary uh, Node.js project. So, first I'll go into init it. Then, um, we got to install the dependencies. So, it's uh, sp and pnp node and uh, sp pnp gs we're going to save them to dependencies and actually even right now we can create uh, a javascript file and uh, write some code actually let me copy it from the github page this one for JavaScript, here we are. Okay, so uh, this code snippet includes uh, requiring of our lovely PNP and uh, PNP node. Uh, PNP node has corresponding class and by creating an instance of which we receive an ability to initiate environment for PNP. And uh, here we can place uh, our code with the PNP JS core. Uh, so literally it's uh, done. And uh, you might ask uh, what about credentials, uh, target uh, environment? And that is a good question. Uh, we will know the answer when running the script. So, sorry. As the script knows nothing about environment and credentials to use, it asked for it in a prompt wizard. Let me provide my test SharePoint Online environment. Let's say this one. Uh, the library is aware of uh, if it is SharePoint Online or on-premises and offers uh, authentication uh, strategies based uh, on which are uh, available in uh, the environment. So I'm going to use uh, user credentials, provide a name and password. And uh, here we are, uh, we got PNP JS core working in Node. Um, and um, um, we received content types, names and descriptions. And on the second run, um, the library will it won't ask for any uh, uh, credentials, any parameters, because it only already knows that. And uh, the parameters are saved by default to the config uh, private JSON file. And uh, here we are, uh, what we uh, provided during the wizard. Uh, password stores uh, in hash form, which can be decrypted only on the machine that it was created. And if we remove uh, something from uh, that file, let's say uh, remove the password and for uh, user credentials, uh, library knows that uh, it's a required field and try to run the script again. Um, we will be prompted with the parameters and um, those parameters which we already provided are uh, here as a default. So we can enter them and place put missed parameter. So password is here and um, we received our information. Uh, let me switch to another example. Okay, this one. 
Um, this um, uh, example is going to reveal two different types of for the library initiation. Um, the first one uh, which we touch is uh, in the previous example is an, an ambient initiation and by ambient I mean that uh, PMP code should be placed inside initiation callback so, so somewhere here. Uh, this approach is good for small scripts when working with the one environment and when we want minify initiation and configuration code uh, and also have no initial credentials in a file or some there. So let's run it. Actually, uh, this is almost the same uh, example as before, but uh, in this case, it's uh, not in JavaScript, but in TypeScript. I'm using uh, TS node to uh, compile, uh, to transpile and run uh, scripts uh, without uh, additional efforts. Uh, okay, so we received a uh, title, a web title information. Um, um, also, uh, here we have uh, an additional uh, configuration options. Um, which are by default optional and takes uh, some default values, but can be um, can be oh something wrong with my TypeScript. Uh, well, actually, I'm going to reveal um, elaborate uh, what kind of settings here in the next examples. So let me switch to the factory mode. Um, this way, um, it allows Node.js uh, to use a uh, fetch uh, client factory approach. Uh, we can easily manipulate with the multiple target environments uh, in this case. So um, such setup uh, uh, solution uh, um, requires a configuration file or files or in other words uh, uh, and, and, and PNP node settings uh, should be configured explicitly. Uh, with factory approach um, we see uh, PNP just course top here uh, each implementation of custom fetch client to use. So uh, we uh, return fetch client factory uh, as a NPM node with parameters. Uh, let's run the script also. Yeah, and uh, after this setup, we could also uh, deal with the um, PNP JS core uh, code. Uh, so it also works. And uh, we could uh, use uh, get web by uh, default one or uh, to use explicit uh, creation on your web based on URLs. Okay, so um, mm -hmm. next one. Here we are. So uh, with PNP on the server, uh, any complex scenarios with a REST API can be used. So you can definitely consume any Node.js library and reuse or you reuse your own uh, code can be and should be uh, structured within the application. Uh, so let me run this one. This application goes uh, through uh, different web artifacts and list data and dumps it on disk. So we're fetching some data and uh, we can see that uh, some new uh, files with the data arrives here. So all of this is using uh, PNP. So also here we can receive a list uh, data. Um, mm -hmm. Let me go back to the main file. Um, this example utilizes uh, modern JavaScript features like async, await, and um, also reveals possibility of uh, configuring PNP setup with additional headers. So in this example, we use um, light out data mode to receive only um, no, no met metadata mode. So uh, it, it can make uh, such application faster, especially when it uh, tries to receive a lot of 
different um, data from the server. Okay, um, well, uh, the code here uh, actually is uh, something which uh, consumes uh, PNP, uh, pretty standard for a, any uh, PNP JS core application. Uh, and uh, uh, you, you could even reuse uh, the same one which uh, uh, I used on the uh, client side and uh, after such setup, it will work on the server. Okay, uh, PNP on the server uh, with the PNP node is definitely testable. And uh, let's check the sample with testing. Um, I use Mocha um, for that purposes and integration tests uh, talking to different environments. And uh, let's run test here. Okay, uh, you can see uh, that uh, test uses uh, multiple environments which are defined uh, in the definition and uh, run uh, the same validations over these different environments in Equi. So after testing in SharePoint Alliance, switch to another environment and so on. Um, let's switch to the code. So uh, before running uh, testing for uh, different environments or using different uh, settings, uh, we need to uh, reconfigure PNP fetch client to use a new uh, instance of uh, PNP node. So in, in this case, uh, uh, in the slope, uh, we receive different um, authentications, different site URLs, and after uh, test go, uh, go uh, through different environments. Uh, and, uh, and here they talking to SharePoint 2013, another form with uh, SharePoint 2016, and online. Okay. Well, uh, after tests are in our disposal, uh, some uh, continuous integration and delivery possibilities can be in demand. And uh, PNP can be executed in a context of a build machine and uh, I want to show very simple, straightforward um, example, which is actually not a continuous integration, or, but just executing a uh, PNP uh, in, inside TFS uh, online build. Okay, here we are. Um, a different build definition and going to run it. Okay. Um, the major difference uh, with the TFS build is uh, how we pass the configuration and credentials uh, to the script. Uh, so uh, it will be running on background, it takes some time. Uh, so um, uh, we use uh, environment variables and uh, secure strings. Uh, environment variables can be easily reused by pro and the name of the parameter and uh, secure strings are passed uh, as uh, um, arguments uh, to the script. So uh, when we are um, defining a task with PNP, uh, we could uh, set up it to execute Node.js uh, and uh, pass in this parameter. Uh, as far as we do not want to show it uh, in a um, it, it, its original form. Okay, maybe it's done. So we are almost there. Okay, okay. So uh, yeah, um, the uh, idea of the script uh, was to uh, print this uh, web title here. So nothing connected with continuous integration, but actually it shows uh, the possibilities of how to extend uh, build process on in TFS to use uh, some robust um, data manipulation with use of uh, being PJS core. Okay, and the last example uh, is uh, um, deploying, uh, not actually deploying, but uh, using uh, proof of uh, proof of using uh, BNP Core.js uh, in, in uh, Azure Web Job. 
So uh, the idea of this particular job is to uh, as simple as possible. Um, Mm -hmm. So, uh, job syncs to lists in different site collections. So, let me open these guys. Uh, here, um, there is a list uh, in site A site collection, and uh, the similar list in uh, site B site collection. Uh, let's deploy the script to the uh, Azure Web uh, service by running a gulp task. Okay. Um, this is not actually a deployment, uh, it just uh, copying some folders and files to the um, Azure app service. So uh, here we are. Uh, actually, files have been published before and job uh, is already configured to run. So we have uh, uh, private configs for two environments, uh, for site A, site B, here they are. And um, um, node models are already installed. So, okay, just one more look to the list. So in uh, site A, we have uh, item A items, inside B item B items, and um, uh, this job uh, is configured to run manually, so let's run it. It takes some time to finish, a couple of seconds. Okay, almost there. Okay, so it is completed. And let's refresh the pages. Here, here we are. We have uh, items B, uh, items A and list B. And uh, the same is here in uh, site A. And um, all of these has been done with the use of uh, a PNP JS core. So the script is pretty simple, actually pretty small. Uh, it reads data from the lists. It writes data to the lists uh, with the use of batches. And uh, during the initiation, uh, it passes different modes for uh, our data. So while reading, it passes uh, no metadata and when uh, writing in a batch, it uh, didn't bother, uh, pass any any error information here. Okay, also, I think, uh, await, and uh, so uh, this was the example uh, how to use uh, PNP just core uh, uh, as a web job, and uh, actually it opens um, great uh, possibilities uh, with the use of automation and uh, our lovely PNP JS core. Um, okay, so um, here we are and done with the demos, uh, which by the way are available on GitHub. There's a link to these examples, and there are some uh, README files, uh, and feel free to ask any questions there as an issue. Uh, I hope that uh, that was interesting, uh, that uh, also I hope that some of you will start using PMP JS Core on the server, and uh, that uh, it will be a straightforward process now with PNP node library. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to the talk. And if there are any questions, I'll try to answer them. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, really outstanding presentation. Amazing to see uh, what you did in Node. And I hope that was uh, you know, really instructional for folks on the kind of power uh, you can really um, you know, bring to the table using uh, these technologies on the server. So we've gone a little long. We'll switch quickly back to the slides, but that was uh, too great of a demo to really try and cut off at all. So really outstanding stuff, Andrew. Um, thanks for doing that, uh, Vesa. Thank you as well, of course, for the great SharePoint Framework Extension demo. Um, as always, invite folks if you have a demo that you would like 
uh, to uh, do on the call, please just let us know. Get in touch. We would love to have you. Our next meeting will be June 22nd. That's my birthday. If anybody would like to virtually get me something, um, I'm kidding, of course. But our next meeting, June 22nd, we'll see everybody then. Thank you all and look forward to working with you all in the future. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.